Okay. So, hello everyone and welcome to the Fire Dragon Festival with Paul Yee and Karen Lee at the Vancouver Public Library. We are super excited for today's event because we are all, all going to be learning about the Fire Dragon Festival traditions. Paul Yee is going to be reading us his Grass Dragon poem and we have the wonderful filmmaker Karen Lee here with us today as well. Plus the event is moderated by VPL's own Todd Wong. And if that isn't enough for you, we are going to have the second of our two-part Cantonese for Beginners lessons tonight. My name is Kenny Tanaka, and I'm the Programming and Learning Event Coordinator at the Vancouver Public Library. My colleague and friend Diane is also here with us tonight, and she'll be helping out in the chat. Now, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are hosting this event from the ancestral, traditional, and stolen homelands of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Now, organizations often do land acknowledgements, but what other actions can we take to make a difference? We're going to share a great resource that I really love. It's actually one of my favorites. And it's a free massive online course that the University of Alberta offers that you can sign up for at any time. And Diane is going to share the link in the chat for us. So let's move on. A few housekeeping things to, to uh, mention about the chat settings. At the bottom of the chat screen, it sometimes defaults to panelists and hosts. So depending on which version of Zoom you're using, you need to change the little blue button to read either panelists and attendees or everyone so that we can all see your comments. Please feel free to make good use of the chat tonight to talk with your friends, you know, other people that you might know, and also to share memories if you have attended any of the Fire Dragon Festival events before, or let us know if you're enjoying the Mid-Autumn Festival. Again, if you have any questions tonight for our panelists, put them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. You can put other comments and give virtual shout outs and high fives to the panelists in the chat. Um, so now, if you joined us last week for the Mid-Autumn Festival, then you met Justin already. And he's back again this week with part two of a short Cantonese lesson for beginners. Justin Chang is an MA graduate from the Department of History at UBC. His research focuses on Hong Kong. In particular, he's interested in the relationships between the colonial government and the Chinese merchants in the early, early 20th century. At UBC, Justin is also a student associate of Hong Kong, Hong Kong Studies Initiative. Justin received a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of California in Berkeley. So I'm gonna send it over to Justin right now, and I'm actually gonna make sure I give Justin screen share privileges. So I'm gonna make him a co-host. There we go. Okay, so over to you, Justin. Great, thank you. So um, yeah, thank you um, for, having us, for having me tonight, and um, thank you all for coming back this week. So um, let's see, so I'm gonna share my slide. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my my sky um for the for the Cantonese. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I hope I hope you all can see it well. Um, so today, I mean, last night was the um Mid Autumn Festival. So today we can, we are talking about the Fire Dragon Festival, which um you know in Vancouver is happening. The coming weekend, but um and, and originally this tradition comes from Hong Kong, um is um, where my, I grew up and um I'm 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 so happy here to to talk a bit more about the origin of this um tradition and also how it was how it looked like in in Hong Kong. So, so yeah yeah so first we come with some couple um basic terms for the fire dragon. So for um the autumn festival, uh, we call it in Cantonese we call it Zhong Tao Ji. Zhong Tao Ji. And um, so Fire Dragon Festival in Cantonese is Fo Long Ji. Fo Long Ji. So Fo means fire and Long means dragon. And Ji uh, means festival. So as I said last week, um, Ji, like you can apply Ji to many different kinds of festival um, in Cantonese. But in Hong Kong, we don't call them, we don't call it Fo Long Ji. We call it, um, we call it Mo Fo Long. So this is the term, Mo Fo Long. So literally it means um, fire dragon dancing. Mo means um, dance, dancing. So, um, you know, when we talk about lion dancing, we call it Mo Si. Yeah, so um, this is what we call it in Hong Kong. And so um, this tradition comes out in, in Taihan on the Hong Kong Island. Um, 
yeah, so let me see some 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 more cap. So Tai Han in in Cantonese is Tai Han, Tai Han. So Hong Kong Island is Hong Kong Do, Hong Kong Do. So basically, Tai Han is a very small, tiny village in Causeway Bay on the island. So um, Causeway Bay, if if anyone has been to Hong Kong or Know a bit more about Hong Kong. Causeway Bay is one of the busiest um, shopping uh, shopping districts in, in Hong Kong. So, so but the Tai Han is um very interestingly Tai Han, which is like on the edge of Causeway Bay, is a very quiet community. Um, like in daily time, like there there are not many shops and restaurants there, and it's very it's very tiny. You can you can um explore the community in like fifteen or half an hour. But we have a great tradition. From there, so this is um, yeah. So this is the map of Hong Kong Island, and you can see the star is what is it where the where Taihan is. So, um, the whole story comes up from a uh, from a typhoon in Hong Kong. So in eighteen eighty, um, a typhoon hit a typhoon hit Taihan. Um, so, you know, um, it, it caused a lot of destruction, and then but after that. Like a python appeared in Taihan village, so people of course killed it, and and that uh, um but but like few days later, um the body of the python disappeared, and then a plague emerged and causing another another huge casualty in the village, so um many people you know there's a huge disaster there, so um and then one night, um some village leaders, um had a dream. In which that the Buddha told them they needed to organize a fire dragon dance around the village, um, and then and also burn some firecrackers on the day of the autumn festival. So they did it, and then the plague um, was gone. So basically, the house the tradition came to be, and so um, they 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 do that um, every year on the autumn festival until now. So basically, the fire dragon dance um, happened on the day before. The autumn festival on the night of that, and also after that, so um, three nights in uh, three nights in a row every year. So, typhoon in Cantonese is typhoon, typhoon, and typhoon in Cantonese is monse, monse, and se basically means snake. So, um, any kind of snakes you can call it se. And um, plague is in Cantonese is one yek, one yek. And um, so, yeah. So you know, um, so in the dragon on the body of dragon, we we stop with with all this um incense, and um, we also burn firecrackers um as the tradition. But nowadays um. Firecrackers, firecrackers is is banned in Hong Kong already. So, so um, like people maybe decades ago, decades decades ago, they they used to do that, but now they can't do it anymore. Um, so, so the Cantonese of incense is hern, hern, and um, the firecrackers in Cantonese is pao zhou, pao zhou. Or you can say, pao zhen, pao zhen, but um, but for for zhen, uh, I highlighted here. You can see the tone is the second tone in red, which means actually um, zhen like there there are two tones in zhen, um, but but none of them was this one. So actually um, I mean it was changed here. So we need to be a more a bit aware of that, like. Because um, Jern, you can put it in in other in other terms, then then uh, it's going to be different another tone. So as we can see the um, the the dragon here. So the the dragon most uh, basically is stuff with the straws, um, and especially the pearl uh, pearl straws, which is like a bit um a bit more doable. Um. So, and then as a I'll put it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, people will will um get the rope as the bone, and then wrap the wrap the body with the 
cool straw. And then after that, they will stop it with the um, incense. And then, um, yeah, it's like 60 me uh, 67 meters long. And there are like 32 sections um, for the whole dragon. And then for the eyes, um, both eyes, are actually they are the electro uh, electric torches and the teeth and the tongue, teeth and tongue here, is, um, they're made up of metal. And, and then that, these two balls in front of the dragon, actually, um, I mean, in tradition, we call, we, we, we call them puros, but actually it, 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 they are like a pamelo stuff uh, with all the um, incense. So kind of like a guide um, for the dragon. And, and here there are two landmarks in the, in the neighborhood in Hong Kong, in Taihan. Um, so so um, the, the, the temple we see on the left um, it will, is the starting point of the uh, final dragon dance. So basically um, they will, the, 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 the dragon will tour around um, in the community. And then also they will drop by a park on the right, um, the Victoria Park, which is um, the largest park on the Hong Kong Island. Um, every year in the Mid Autumn Festival, they will have a huge um, lantern um, exhibition, like just like what you see here in the picture, um, with, like all the, with all these um, huge big lanterns. And then at the end of the um, whole tour, um, in the past they would, they would throw the dragon into the water in the um, typhoon shelter nearby, but you know it's not environmental friendly, so nowadays they will um, burn it instead. So. Temple, the Lin Fa Temple, um, in Cantonese we call it Lin Fa Gong Lin Fa Gong. So Lin Fa actually means lotus. So yeah, the temple of lotus it means. And then the Victoria Park, um, in Cantonese we call it Wai Do Lei A Gong Yun. Wai Do Lei A Gong so um what so what do they are means it's just like a translation of Victoria actually yeah and Gong Yun is park so here we have like the what do they are Gong Yun yeah um, yeah so here we can um go through all the all the vocabs again um so from the starting from the left. Zhong Chao Ji. Zhong Chao Ji is the Mid Autumn Festival. And um, Fire Dragon Festival is Fo Long Ji. Fo Long Ji. And um, Fire Dragon Dancing, Mo Fo Long. Mo Fo Long. And typhoon is Toi Fong Toi Fong Python is Mon Se Mon Se and play is One Yik One Yik Incense is Hern Hern so you can see it's the same as the uh, Hong Kong that, that horn. And firecracker is pao jok, pao jok. Or you can say pao zhen, pao zhen. So um, Hong Kong Island is hong gong do, hong gong do. Tai Han is Dai Han, Dai Han. Lin Fa Temple is Lin Fa Gong, Lin Fa Gong. Victoria Park is Wai Do Lei A Gong Yun, Wai Do Lei A. Yeah, so um so I hope I hope like um people who, who, who haven't been to Hong Kong or haven't uh, watched this um fire dragon dancing all um in Taihan 
in person, I, I, I hope like you will get to get a chance to see it if you have a chance to go to Hong Kong. Um, I mean, I did it. I have done it because I, actually I, I grew up like, uh, I spent my high school nearby. Um, and, and um, but for those who, who, who can't like um, in the pandemic period, uh, yeah, this, this period of time. Um, so I hope, I hope um, we all can come out and go to Chinatown and to see this uh, fire dragon um, this weekend in Chinatown. Yeah. So I think that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. That was great. Very informative too. I learned a lot and I would love to go to Hong Kong one day and see the Fire Dragon Festival there. Um, what I'm going to do though right now is I'm going to introduce tonight's moderator and also our uh, guests as well. So moderator Todd Wong is a fifth generation Chinese Canadian head tax descendant active in the literary arts and dragon boat communities of Vancouver. He is creator of the annual Gung Haggis Fat Choi Robbie Burns Chinese New Year that's now been running for over 20 years and has helped found the, the successful campaign to save the Joy Kagawa House. Todd is the longest serving director and current president of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. We also have with us tonight, Paul Yi. Paul Yi is a Chinese Canadian historian and writer with a master's in history from UBC. Paul was raised in Vancouver's Chinatown and worked as an archivist at the City of Vancouver Archives. And, uh, and also tonight we have Karen Lee, a second generation community activist. Her parents, Wally Lee and Lee Ma, were uh, Lil Ma were in, instrumental in the development of the Chinese Cultural Center in the Dr. Sun Yat Sen Gardens, as well as connecting traditional Chinese clan and Freemasons organizations with progressive community members and Chinese Canadian youth. Karen was born and raised in Vancouver and has been making films since the early 1990s. So I'm going to turn it over to Todd and Paul's actually going to um, give us a little bit more on his bio. I'm sure, sorry that I cut it a little short there just a little bit but over to you three enjoy oh thank you thank you thank you thank you very much candace um candy now part of it is we want to invite paul to speak about the fire dragon pictures of the grass dragon because if you go into the vancouver public library archives you will see pictures that paul took we want to hear from karen whose parents were instrumental in helping to build community in Chinatown. What was it like for you, Paul and Karen, growing up in Chinatown during the 1970s? Paul and then Karen? Okay, well, I, I, I grew up in the 60s. I'm a bit older than Karen, <laughs> sorry to say. So I grew up in the 60s and Chinatown was very quiet then. It was sort of on on its sort of last legs. I remember the, the, the most surprising thing about Chinatown back then was that it closed on Sundays for half a day. It only, the businesses were only open in the mornings. That is, un, that became unimaginable in the 1970s and 80s and 90s when Chinatown um, became extremely, extremely busy. But the Chinatown that I grew up in the 1960s was quiet as a business place, but very busy in the evenings and weekends because of the, the, the huge number of banquets that were happening um, at that time. So um, for me, I grew up in a family uh, that had connections to Chinatown associations, the Wongs, um, as well as different families. So there were always, um, 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 association banquets to go to or family banquets involving um, full month or weddings. So those are my memories of Chinatown um, as a kid, you know, great food in Chinatown, get dressed up, great restaurants, lots of neon, um, uh, a really uh, lovely place uh, um, full of bright lights, but um, no grass dragon. Mm. Karen? Karen, you're muted. You're right. I'm a little bit younger than you, but not that by that much. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, eight years or something. Maybe. Um, for me, growing up in Chinatown, you know, as I mentioned, my parents were 
um, quite involved. Um, uh, mostly my, my mother uh, worked for a Chinese Canadian lawyer. His name was Andrew Joe. And Andrew Joe and my father became partners in his uh, in their communist bookstore that was on East Hastings. So both uh, many people in the generation above me were instrumental in being activists in a very different way. I think the activism changed from generation to generation. And I think by the time <clears throat> Paul and I were sort of, you know, on the scene in the 70s, there were the sort of um, older generation who were working towards um, finding a way to develop Chinatown as a viable place in the same way that we're doing that now, but really to look at culture and to look at identity. So um, me growing up there was very similar, ran around and, and you know, even though we didn't live in Chinatown, <clears throat> I was there quite a bit. And it was the kind of place where you could just go to like, you know, any cafe or any restaurant and then get something and then say, put on my dad's tap. You know, like those, those were the kind of things that, that we could do because they knew who we were and all of that kind of stuff. So that was, that was really kind of fun. There were also a lot of divisions in the community. Politically, there were divisions generationally. Um, the generation before us, a lot of them were um, very progressive and they were um, interested in opening up um, Canada to China at that time. And of course, most people um, that had immigrated here uh, really hated China because of what had happened to their families. And, uh, and then there was also the generation like my mother and my grandfather and all of those people that were born here and were part of a very small, um, close-knit community um, because who, whoever was in Chinatown was really the community. Um, and there were a lot of people that lived in outlying areas, but the Chinatown there, I think for me, it just reminded me of, um, by the time I was, you know, growing up there, it reminded me of a place where it was both uh, a place of solace and community, but also it was a place where um, there was a lot of infighting in the community about what does it mean to be Chinese? What does it mean to be Chinese Canadian? And what are the things that are going to be explored in the coming years? And, um, and so I think that the generation that Paul and I kind of belong to were part of that um, community that looked at Chinese Canadian identity. Who are we, who are not, who are we as immigrants, but who are we that were born here and grew up here? So that's kind of the, the gist of the, I guess, for me, the straw dragon also was a reflection of something um, Chinese Canadian in a way, because even though it came from Hong Kong, it was developed by um, Chinese Canadians here that wanted to um, bring culture back into the community. Anyways, I've had, an, I've said enough for now. I'm going to give it back. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. And I, of course, we, you and I, we've talked about we're the same age, but I grew up in Chinatown. My father uh, was a sign writer. He, he did the signs, all the signs for Marco Polo restaurant to see what was happening in Chinatown. And of course, Chinatown sort of grew up and then it dissipated because, you know, people could move to the other parts of the country the systemic racism that had existed before. Uh, Roy Ma and my uncle Daniel Lee had gone to Ottawa and we were able to vote. So there was that sense of rising Asian Canadian identity. And thank you, Paul, for loaning me your books many, many years ago to see what was happening in the United States as Asian American identity formed. So yes, we were looking for that. And somebody trying to create Asian Canadian identity to be proud of who we are, what we did. They started creating um, the Chinese New Year Parade and somebody came up with the grass dragon idea. So that was Jim Wang Chu, I know, um, from watching the videos in the Chinese Canadian Museum pop-up down in Chinatown. So if you haven't seen it, 
go down to Chinatown, go to the Museum of Vancouver. They've got a seat at the table. So I want to ask Paul, your connection with Jim, how were you involved in it? Because your pictures are in the Vancouver Public Library archives and Karen then follow up with what you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, well, I'm actually very surprised to hear that I have photographs um, of the Grass Dragon because my recollection of the evening of the parade was I was in the parade. Ah. I, wasn't, I wasn't shooting photographs. So I actually don't believe I shot any photos. We'll have to correct those see, things, Candy. We'll have to correct them at the bank VPL. Yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to take credit from somebody else's photographs. Um, but as you say, um, it was Jim Wong Chu's idea. I think it was um, the summer of 1975. Um, and I think I was working on a summer grant in Vancouver's Chinatown at the Chinese Cultural Center. And Jim Wong Chu would come in a lot and, you know, he knew the people there. And, and of course, Jim Wong Chu was very cagey. He, he always stayed outside the, the grasp and the, the, the allure of the Chinese Culture Center because he said, I want to be able to criticize the Chinese Culture Center if I belong to it as a member. Well, I'll be silenced. So he always <laughs> maintained this outsider stance, which was great. And he could kind of float in, float these ideas around, and then float out. But in the case of the grass dragon, he took it on. He, he rounded up the people who could make it happen. He tracked down, I believe, where the grass could be harvested. Like, I mean, I, I can't imagine how one finds grass long enough that is going to turn into straw that is available in such a quantity for us. But lo and behold, Jim Wong Chu, through his astounding connections, found farms that had this grass. And then, of course, Jim continued working on the different chunks of it um, throughout this whole dragon, grass dragon process. Um, and I wasn't involved in all the, the pieces. Um, um, so, uh, I've seen pictures of different parts of the grass dragon, but I think they were, it was very sort of um, not well documented because a lot of it was happening um, in the evenings and in, in sort of underground warehouses. <laughs> People were just kind of, it was all very makeshift. Um, you have to remember at this time, the Chinese culture sector was really just a, a storefront operation. We, we kind of lived from grant to grant to grant. And of course, the Chinese Culture Center ran festivals, sponsored festivals at um, for the spring at Chinese New Year's and in the autumn for Mid-Autumn Festival as fundraising events and as a way to highlight the different parts of the community and community culture. So when Jim Wong Chu said, you know, how about the Grass Dragon for the Mid-Autumn Festival? People went, hmm, that sounds really interesting. And that's how I think it started. What do you remember, Karen? Um, I remember um, my father, who um, was part of the Chinese Freemasons, the Chinese Athletic Club. Um, he kind of ran all the lion dances and stuff uh, on New Year's. And he said, oh, uh, this, young, this young guy came up and asked uh, the Chinese Freemasons, if we could get a um, grass dragon from Hong Kong. And they said, absolutely not. We're not gonna get a grass dragon from Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Why don't you make it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I, and, and also I think that it was a really interesting um, intersection at that point because um, it was now the, the, the responsibility of someone like Jim Wong Chu to gather enough community to make the dragon and also to be invited to show that this could be done and then be a part of, uh, you know, like other larger line dances and festivals and, and that kind of thing. Because if you look in the picture, there's um, a lot of people that were in the athletic club or the, you know, Kung Fu clubs or whatever in Chinatown, they're all part of 
that whole thing. And then, you know, it was interesting because the old Sifus started to now come together because it became a reality through these young people who had built this um, dragon. And um, like you, I was, you know, wanting to be in, I wanted to be part of it. Um, but as Justin was saying, it's traditionally young men who, um, you know, who are part of the dragon and then you need many, many people and you need to keep taking shifts and everything else. Cause I wanted to be at the very end. I wanted to be at the tail, but little did I know that when you're on the tail, you're whipped. Like it is the hardest, the, the, the head and the, and the tail are the hardest positions because you have no control of where the, the dragon goes. So I was always sort of like in the middle and I was also very short. So, you know, I could only do it for so long. Um, but I think that that was a seminal moment really to become part of a larger community, you know, besides what the cultural center was now doing and the clan community, clan um, um, uh, centers, they, they really, they really didn't welcome young people to be a part of that. Whereas the group that was trying to build the Chinese Cultural Center were really progressive and wanted to everybody to, you know, start to come together. I think that that was seminal in the in the mid seventies. Well, you're absolutely right about different parts of the community coming together under the Grass Dragon because I remember the night of the parade people from um, the other athletic association showed up. I remember people from Hong Sing yeah. were there, big guys who could manage the tail. And I was thinking, wow, I, you don't see these guys doing this anymore because they usually leave it to the really young folks. But for this, these older, these sort of middle-aged guys came out. I was so impressed. It, yeah. it was, as you said, um, different parts of the community. And, and it, it, I don't, I don't think people know how diverse the community was then and how, in a way, how unusual it was for young people like you and me to get involved because we had all grown up speaking English, assimilated. We were all kind of taken away from Chinatown um, as kids, as teenagers, and we kind of had to fight our own way back to Chinatown because our parents and our caregivers thought, you speak English, why would you want to go to Chinatown? And yet, in the 70s, because of all the activity that was going on there, because of the progressive politics, it was really magnetic. It, it was a fascinating time to be there. And the Night of the Grass Dragon was amazing just to see so many different parts of the community come out. I mean, I mentioned these older people, but there were these young kids from Hong Kong. These were like gyms, Kung Fu students, they showed up. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing time for Chinatown because up until 1967, the only immigrants who could come in had to be sponsored by a family member after the Chinese Exclusion Act all the way up to 1947. And then with the fear of a Hong Kong takeover, the changeover is gonna happen in the 80s you know, people were coming into the 70s. Well, maybe it hadn't hit them yet, but more people were able to come in on the point system. And I remember my cousins, uh, Hain and Joe Wei, they were involved in the Chinese Cultural Center. They were part of the young activists. Uh, Joe was part of SPODA, helping to prevent the bulldozers from, from building the freeway in Chinatown. And I saw him at the the shovel, uh, the, the dirt turning ceremony for the Chinese Cultural Center building. So all this was starting to happen in Chinatown. How do the younger people take part of that? How do we reclaim, or how do we come to terms with the Chinese Canadian identity? Because China at that point still was regarded as a third world country. And how do you take pride in yourself? So that was really very good to hear what's happening. And I. And I have to tell you guys, and I know I sent you pictures on email of m myself being involved in building this year's grass dragon. It was really cool. Um, Candy, do you have pictures of what the, the grass dragon looked like? Do you, can you show them now? 
because it was, I think, Mel Wu who took over um, how to build a grass dragon, how to research it. And he went out to Langley or Surrey to farms to get the grass and then the hay. And he said, we have to put incense in. And he was testing it to see how long the incense will work. How deep does the grass dragon have to be that spine to hold the incense? Because we don't just set the grass dragon on fire and call it a fire dragon. It's going to be smoking with incense through um, Chinatown. It's going to be so exciting. They've set up torches because normally we see a dragon and I've got my little six person dragon here. And we take, you know, this 90 foot dragon through daylight for the Chinese New Year Parade. This is going to be so cool at night. So Candy, do you have those pictures? And then we can come back to Paul and Karen. Yeah, let me just, um, I'm just going to um, open them up. So maybe if you just want to keep on talking and then I'll okay, have them ready in a, in a minute or so. Yeah. I, I so just the grass, yeah, the Grass Dragon Festival is going to happen in Chinatown this weekend from September 24th to the 26th. Karen, if you want to be part of it, invite your children because she's a BPL employee now. I've met and worked with her. Um, <laughs> there are workshops on Friday to be part of the grass dragon, how to carry that. They're gonna have so many volunteers coming in. And I, I talked to Mel when he was building the grass dragon. I went on the second day, June Chow, who helped invite me to be part of this and help organize you guys. She was there on the first day. It's mind boggling how you can create from grass, this long 90 foot dragon and then they're gonna put incense on it, send it through. Because last weekend in Chinatown, there was the uh, Light Up Chinatown event. A lot of people went, there were so many restaurants that were open, events are happening. So if you go to firedragonfestival.com, you can see the whole list of activities. There'll be music performances, restaurants will be open. Um, it will be so cool. Let's see what happens. Candy, you've got those pictures now. <laughs> um, ah, mm. yes, so there's pictures of people working on the grass dragon, they're wrapping it up. Um, we had to bind it with, with rope and string to create a body for the dragon, and then we had to add more for the spine so that it was deep enough we could stick incense in. Let's see. Do, and there were, was a call out from Ainsley Wong. Ainsley is a volunteer coordinator. She was trying to call on all her different people. How do we have enough volunteers to create this grass dragon? Betty Chuck is the event coordinator. Um, she's been sending me some emails on asking, Todd, can you be storytelling on Friday and Saturday? But no, I'm working at the Vancouver Public Library and I ran out of vacation time, I'm sorry. Um, do we have any more pictures there, Candy? Um, I asked Mel, how did you come up with this idea to great, create this grass dragon? He said, Sonny Wong called me. Sonny was for many years the um, manager of the Dragon Boat Festival. Oh, there you can see the details of the grass. They're binding it with straw. Yeah, so Sonny is a longtime buddy of mine as well. Um, he worked with the, the Dragon Boat Festival is going to be happening the same week again. There'll be music over there. They're going to try and do some tie-ins, maybe some Dragon Boat teams. Of, oh, Mel is working there on the head. I think that's Pearl. Um, she came in as a volunteer from, she's just moved from New York City. And the week later, she's volunteering to help create this dragon, this fire dragon festival. So it, that's a back room at the Chinese Cultural Center, David Lamb Hall. So mm -hmm. people are working. You can see it, how long and skinny this dragon boat, or sorry, this grass dragon is. The, the floors, we've got hay on it. Lots of different volunteers coming from all different walks of life. Um, there we go. <laughs> Does it make you want to Read your poem about grass dragons, Paul. Actually, I just wanted to pick up on something you said earlier, which was um, Chinatown changing after 1967. And, and I just want to acknowledge that the revitalization of Chinatown in the 1970s 
was due to Hong Kong immigration. That was the major source of Chinese immigration to Canada after 1967. And it was their kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Um, Chinatown suddenly got Canto Pop music. We had three or four uh, movie houses showing Hong Kong movies. Suddenly there was a whole new wave of Hong Kong culture that was coming into Chinatown and which was proving very attractive to a younger generation because it was so cool in a way. So that's another chunk of the history um, when you want to look at it, that Hong Kong's immigration had a really profound effect on Vancouver and Canada um, in that period prior to the immigration patterns changing to other source countries. And that's, uh, that's also interesting because when you think of the generation that came before, those who came to join their families in 48, there were a lot of educated um, Chinese who came over here and they were the ones who really believed in what China was doing. So there were small groups of very, very progressive uh, socialists that wanted to move forward with creating um, a stronger community. And, and, and so that was my father's generation and all his people trying to make Chinatown a better place. And then as you, you, know, as you mentioned with the new Hong Kong immigrants that were coming in, that whole time in the 70s, you know, everybody, when they come in, they think of their homeland and they think of what we can do to make it better. So same with those people that came in 68, not necessarily as um, joining their families. And that kind of energy, I remember, was very optimistic. And, you know, I was a child basically I got dragged around every everywhere and protests on the streets. I mean, I, I just did what my parents told me to do. But when the when these younger people started to get together and started to work together, it was cool. And you were seeing people who actually wanted to do things. I mean, I, I didn't want to do any of that when I was a kid. I was just forced to do it. But in the mid 70s, there was a lot of really interesting energy and there was a lot of expression. So when we talk about what was traditional and what is contemporary, the expression of what uh, we might've felt as young people was starting to evolve in the seventies, which was again, um, this whole idea of Chinese Canadian identity. And I think <clears throat> this a whole idea of the dragon which of course needs teams and teams of people to be a part of it, you feel like you are part of something much larger. You feel like you're part of a piece that's going to continue to, you know, dance through the streets. And it was a very um, exciting time. And it's also a reflection really of today, you know, where there's so many young people that want to um, have a new renaissance of Chinatown because it's gone way to the bottom and it was really neglected and all of that. So I'm really excited um, with all the people that are really involved right now and what they're doing. They're doing amazing things. And I, and it's, uh, again, it's a very optimistic time. Absolutely, Karen. That's the way to put it. We have seen so many different waves of Chinese diaspora coming into Vancouver from Taiwan, from China, from the Seychelles Islands. Um, I've even on my dragon boat team, we've had people from Italy and Scotland, but they want to connect with their Chinese heritage. What do they do? They come to Chinatown, they come to the New Year's festival, they, they join a dragon boat festival team. You know, here's a little Lego um, dragon. <laughs> but what do we do to create and bond people together? And part of it, um, Jim Wong Chu also saw poetry, Asian Canadian writing. It didn't really happen until starting into the late seventies. Part of the legacy was um, in 1982, we start to see photographs, we start to see art, film. And Paul, you were right there with Jim for the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop. 
and um, he was a big inspiration for you as well. 1986, uh, Paul, you started the Saltwater City ex exhibit. My cousin Hain said, Todd, you want to volunteer? And I was just in awe of all you guys, and it really helped me connect with things. So, Paul, please. Okay, so let's let's just go. I'm, I'm just looking at the time now. Um, yes, so before we want to have I, a Q&A. So before I read the poem, I just want to say a few words about it. Now, this poem that you're going to hear was actually written after the event, that is after the Grass Dragon had come to life on Pender Street back in 1975. But in the poem that, that you hear, the narrator's position is actually timed before the parade. And, and so the poem tells of the creation of the Grass Dragon um, by volunteers, as I recall, but the Grass Dragon in the poem has not risen to its feet yet. And so for me, the poem has always been about hopes and dreams about to happen, about projects um, and efforts still in process, not finished. And, and that's why I agreed to read the poem tonight, because I think Chinatown today is still very much about hopes and dreams, and a lot of unfinished business is going on. So this poem was written 45 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> two lifetimes ago for me. Um, and, and I was just one of many volunteers newly drawn to Chinatown to help out. And so today, as Karen has mentioned, there are a lot of new volunteers working in Chinatown on many issues. And I am so glad to see this. And they, like our generation, Karen and my generation, are just as driven by hopes and dreams for Chinatown. That's our connection. So uh, we'll go to the poem. Oh, but here's a bit of trivia for you. In one of the published versions of the poem, the Swallowing Clouds version from 1999, hmm. there's a typo in it. Ah. <laughs> so anyways, nothing's perfect, right? Okay, so here's the poem. The Grass Dragon, and the poem, when I wrote it, I dedicated it to Jim Wang Chu, who had the idea, and to the Chinese Culture Center, who had the festival. So, Pender Street is silent this Sunday morning. Early cooks pass by, rub sleep from eyes, and wonder who we are. And we are gathered with our cleavers and our clippers. The Kung Fu kids can't stay still and slash with them and play kill. The rest would rather sleep a while. The farm is 40 minutes away. The grass is long and moist, just what the master ordered. Grass for our grass dragon, yet to be awakened, grass from the Fraser soils, we've body to legend. We unload ourselves from the truck and survey the field, but how do you start? We're city people, suddenly free. We've never seen the earth from our knees. We spread out to work. Had clench the grass, pull it taut, cut it away near the root, lay it aside and move on. The grass grows wild and sharp. We dig for gloves. Our knees are wet and black and we squat instead. There's a jug of tea, Chinese pastries, two loaves of uncut bread and cheese, green plums, from the deserted orchard. We are hungry and we come together, but there are parallel parties of echo. Chinese bounces by us and they can't catch our laughs. Still, we're smiling at each other. We are back in the earth, bent and pulling, cutting and aching, thankful for the merciful clouds and pray that the rain will wait. Was it like this in the rice paddies? 
The grass we tie into bundles piled high in the driveway. At two, we make a chain, pass our labor onto the truck, lining a bed that we jump into for a sweet trip home together. We come out again three times more. We sail out earlier, sweep further up the valley for the finest long grass, lean and supple, dragon grass seeded from hope and daring. And this dream ripens into gold as our harvests rise higher, sweating in a Strathcona garage. And the festival drifts close as the autumn moon swells full. We are underground carpenters scattered throughout Chinatown. In the warehouse basement, long handfuls of grass are coiled, wrapped into tendons for a rippling whip. Now at ease, laid door to door, back and forth, waiting for the thunder of heavy drums and the running, rolling feet to pump life and fire and fury through its straw dry veins. In another basement, up Pender Street, more hands cast a noble head, raising a wooden snout high like a prow, flanked by proud eyes and soaring whiskers of coiled foil. It will be the first. Girls have never run the dragon poles. We have never seen this dragon or known its tradition. Jaw sticks to fan out from its life core of grass, stabbing the moon with a million bristling glowing eyes. It will catch the screams of the children, pound Pender Street in a new beat, spark memories of old China, exploding in a new cloud of firecracker incense. Summon us to celebrate our first dragon made in Canada. We can only wait. We can hardly wait. Wow, thank you, Paul. That is amazing. And who imagined that it would take almost 40 years before there's another grass dragon? Actually, it's more than 40 years. Um, and thank you to Fred Ma um, for coming up with this idea to keep going with this dragon for this year's festival and initiated the Fire Dragon Festival this year, the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Committee for following through on it, getting the cultural and heritage working group working on this. It's amazing for people. Um, Candy, do we have any questions for people? Is there a Q&A? We've got a few minutes more left. We from do Carrie actually, to host. Yeah, we do have quite a few questions and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, ask you them all, ask all of you them actually, because I know that you can't see them too hard. Uh, so Dawn has a question and I think this is for Justin. So Justin, if you wanna come back on stage, if you're still with us, Dawn has two questions. Um, She's wondering why firecrackers are now banned in Hong Kong or for anybody that knows. And then also her other question is, what was the photo beside the word epidemic referencing? There seemed to be British and South Asian people in the street. Yeah, these are good, uh, interesting questions. I didn't expect that, but, but, but well, it's, um, it, yeah, yeah, but I can answer them. So the first one about the firecrackers, actually they got banned in, um, after the 1967 riots. riots. So, um, you know, the communist, um, they, they, they launched a riot in Hong Kong in, in the 67. And I think, I think that's also one of, one of the reasons that um, caused a huge, um, like the, the wave of immigration to Canada um, in the 70s or 60s. Yeah, but anyway, so after that, um, the, the government banned um, the firecrackers and um, they technically lived it in the 70s, but actually they only lived it for the uh, government functions, like, you know, the, um, nowadays the fireworks, um, on the second day of New Year, of, uh, of the Lunar New Year, and also on, on some other days, and also some other theme park, um, like Disneyland or Ocean Park, like they can, they can um, have fireworks, you know, 
that what we see on the sky. Um, they, they, they can do that by applying the, a license um, from the government. Um, so yeah, I think, I think by law, they, they, they technically, they don't dis really distinguish like the firecrackers um, traditionally and also the fireworks that we see in the sky. Um, but well, but nowadays there's some, uh, there's still some like illegal firecrackers in uh, New Tartus in the traditional villages, but you know, that's another story. And um, for the pictures that I, I showed on the on the slide about the the plague, it was actually um, I'm I'm not so sure if that's the real picture from Hong Kong. I mean, I just find it online, but but um, I guess it's it's referring to the the plague that happened in the um, 18, 1894 and ninety five, um, which um caused it by the by the wrecks. And so it, it was um, spread from China to Hong Kong and it caused a, a huge, huge um, of a casualty and also a huge awareness of the hygiene in, in the government, also in the Chinese community, because like back then people would think like, um, oh, okay, so it was, of course, there was pre racist at that time. So people, the government would think like, um, Chinese was like more dirty, or not hygienic as the European did. And so they focus on um, all this cleaning the, 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 the area that Chinese lived in Hong Kong. And also because of all this sort of like social uh, discrimination stuff, um, actually the cost, like the huge um, casualty was on Chinese much more than on European. And of course that, that um, this period also led to a lot of like social and government changes. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of, so it, it, it was actually a huge event in Hong Kong. And then the, the people you see um, in the red uniform that um, in, like who are British, well, of course, I think they're government officials, but for those um, South Asians, I guess they were the policemen in, in Hong Kong because in the past, um, British brought, brought the South Asian from India and their colonies to Hong Kong to serve as policemen. Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Great, and I see here, there's another question I think that was partially answered, but Michael's wondering, what is Todd's jacket called? I don't know, Michael. <laughs> I just bought it in uh, one year at, in Chinatown at the Bamboo Village. I love it. Okay, Go down to I Chinatown think... <laughs> and we'll see you. Arlene kind of answered it. She said, my nap, my nap. She doesn't know the Chinese characters um, or the, the Mandarin uh, pronunciation. Uh, we do have a few other questions here. Uh, so let me find out where are we here. Um, Carrie is wondering if your parents experienced more racism, I guess, uh, back in the day, do you think? And that's a question for everyone. Uh, well, I was actually, I was raised by an aunt who was born in Vancouver in 1895. So she lived through the 1907 riots, she lived through really the darkest period of the anti-Chinese racism uh, that was in BC. And I think it marked her very seriously because I came to her as a child um, in the 1960s and we lived in, in Strathcona and she would send me to Chinese school in, uh, at the Munkarang Chinese School. But I remember her warning to me. Um, she would say, now, if you're on the street and there's any trouble, you run into, this store or that store because you'll be safe there. So even in the 1960s, my aunt was still afraid of anti-white, anti-Chinese racism um, happening on Pender Street, right in Chinatown. And when I think of that, it's like, wow, it scares me. So racism in my family. Um, for my family, I think that it's, being in every generation from, you know, my great grandfather that was in Barkerville, there was a lot of racism there. And also in, you know, Nanaimo and Victoria and Vancouver. And, you know, like Paul says, I mean, I'm con not, it wasn't really my father who was worried about racism. It was my mother because it was my mother's family that bore the brunt for three generations um, in Nanaimo and, and um, also in Vancouver. And she just said, you know, you can't trust anybody who is Caucasian. And that is that. 
you can have some friends, but don't get married to them. And uh, don't mix with them because, you know, they're, they're, they're just going to get their relatives and they're going to treat you badly. And, and so that, that is a reflection of the, um, of the uh, fear and um, the kind of treatment that they had growing up. Um, you couldn't really walk alone if you were, you know, a young person outside of Chinatown. And even in Chinatown, there was a lot of people coming in to drink and to, you know, party. Um, so I think that the racism today is very different from the kind of uh, racism that there was in the 70s and, you know, 30s and, and of course, 120 years ago. But it's still there. Uh, it's just taken um, a different form. Um, but yes, there was a lot of racism and it's intergenerational how it affects the, the way that you bring your children up, your children or your relatives or, or whatever. They're always, they were always warned, be careful, be careful, be careful, because you don't know what's going to happen to you. I think I, rem I remember that my father had told me, you've got to work harder because you're Chinese. And he told me that he would go check out an apartment and they were told at the time, oh, it's already been rented. But learning the history and the systemic racism that they went through, I think it really, um, for me, inspired me to create Gung Hag's Fat Choi where Scottish and Chinese, we can create um, a mixture of events. In every generation on both sides, my mother's side and my father's side of the family, we see almost everybody has married white people. They've married um, First Nations people. So how do we continue to create families that um, fight against racism with all the current anti-Asian hate that's going on during COVID times? And maybe this fire dragon is just what we need to dispel the hate, dispel the plague, and to uh, take pride and in, in create something new. So thank you for asking that question. And uh, the Ma family's wondering when, when they can see the spectacle of the smoking dragon. <laughs> it's going to happen this weekend. Go to firedragonfestival.com. You know, Ma family, please sign up to, um, be part of the dragon. They're doing workshops on Friday night or Friday day. Um, there's going to be educational um, storytelling and introductions for passers-by. The fire, dra this grass dragon will actually be on display um, Friday in Chinatown. Go to the website, it'll be on display on Sunday, but the big event happens on Saturday night when I'm supposed to be actually moderating another event for Word Vancouver about Jim Wong Chu with Madeline Teen and other Asian Canadian writers. So I'm gonna be in Chinatown and I'm gonna be watching it while I moderate. <laughs> and the Ma family also wants to know what happened to the original fire dragon has, and has the making of this year's dragon been documented so that future generations can resurrect it. Hopefully we don't have to wait for another 40 years for its reappearance. Does anyone know what happened to the original fire dragon in Vancouver? Maybe they... No. A, a lot of things um, that were stored in the Chinese Cultural Center, when they, um, when they changed management, they just threw a lot of things out. Uh, you know, a lot of things that were part of the 70s, 80s, um, even the 90s when we were doing, um, you know, exhibitions and things there. I mean, the Women's Committee had raised so much money and they'd put all their stuff in there and then it just all got thrown out. So there wasn't this sense that it was an important part of um, the heritage to keep those things, to sort through them, to document it. Um, so I think it just got thrown out. I mean, I don't know, maybe somebody else knows where it is, but I believe it was just thrown out. Remember that Justin said that initially they used to throw it in the water afterwards, but it wasn't environmentally correct. So now they just burn it. I don't know what Mel has in his plans for that. He was so intent on just trying to make it work and put all the incense in. Uh, there will be VIPs 
at the eye dotting ceremony. So thank you, Ainsley, for reminding us there'll be an eye dotting ceremony to make the dragon come alive at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Somebody says that the dragon's going to go into storage. Oh, Michael Brophy is asking, what is that orange thing probably in front here? This is a Lego uh, dragon. Mm. So there we go. From Kelsey Lee, she has to leave now. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, Candy, are we going to wrap up now? Um, yeah. There are more events? Yes, definitely. I'm going to uh, do the wrap. I basically want to thank everyone for joining us online tonight. A huge thank you to Paul. Uh, Karen, Todd, and Justin, and a big thanks to June Chow from the Youth Collaborative of Chinatown for organizing uh, this event tonight, and to Zoe Lam for connecting us with Justin. And thank you to my colleague Diane for helping out tonight to keep the event running smoothly. So we'd love to receive feedback for this event. As a public institution, we are here for you. So Diane is going to share a link to the feedback form, and I think she might have already done that. Um, but there are a few exciting events coming up that we want to tell you about. So obviously we have the official Fire Dragon Festival coming up this weekend, September 24th to 26th. There's going to be cultural performances, a Chinese painting workshop, Chinese opera makeup demonstration, lots of food, and of course the main Fire Dragon events. You can find out about all the events on the website that Diane's going to share in the chat. And I think the last um, link actually is about, has more of the main activities that's going to give more of a breakdown of the times. Uh, for the events. And uh, tomorrow at noon here at the library, we are doing a lunch hour event that you are invited to attend with author Max Porter. He's going to be discussing his book called The Death of Francis Bacon, where he takes us inside the mind of the famed British painter in his final days. And Diane will share a link to the chat um, in the chat about that one. So thank you again all for coming tonight. Goodbye for now, but we are going to leave the event open for a few more minutes so that if there's any links that you want to click on, you can do that. And uh, Diane will share the links that you can watch this event again, if you missed any part of it, or if you want to go through Justin's uh, conversation, uh, you know, conversational Cantonese on there. So share it with your friends. And thank you again for coming tonight. And we hope to see you all again soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.